Okay, on behalf of Mark, I'd like to answer a couple of these questions. Why is your name Mark Lanier? No, oh. I can't answer that. Okay, are we doing Q&A now? We're Q&A. I just got caught up talking to Candela, an exchange student from Spain. Ah. She's right over here, if anybody gets a chance to talk to her. And then also, we have three exchange students from China over here at this table, Angel, Debbie, and Grace. And so if you get a chance to visit with them as well. And the reason my name is Mark Lanier, my real first name is William, which was my father's name. My father was William Howard Lanier, and um, he went by Bill as he grew, uh, 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 was older. And my parents detested the name Howard, so they didn't want to saddle me with that. Um, but they liked the name Mark. It wasn't a family name or anything. It, uh, uh, it's a biblical name, and my mom was real intent on giving me some type of a biblical name. And so William, from my father, Mark, as a biblical name, as someone who speaks the gospel, she hoped when I grew up. Uh, my mom uh, had prayed real hard for a son and had told the Lord that if she got one, she would dedicate him to her. And she told me that when I was growing up, and she said, you better do right, um, because uh, you belong to God, and he's going to be really ticked if you don't. <laughs> so that's uh, where my name came from. So that's the etymology of Mark Lanier. We're going to check that marked as answered. Uh, okay. That's remarkable. Thank you. <laughs> Mark my word. Now, we're going we're gonna to jump... We're running out of time, so we're going to jump right down. We've got a half, about a half hour. We're going to jump right down into some serious stuff first, seriously. Um, knowing that Jesus is the one that gave himself up on the cross and that it was God's plan, from an earthly standpoint, would you say, or maybe even from a legal standpoint, would you say that Pilate or Caiaphas was more responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus? Oh, excellent. You want to know who was most responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus? Let me do it this way. Have you ever seen a Western? And I don't just mean a Western. I mean the really good ones. Like hang them high. Fistful of dollars. For a few dollars more. The good, the bad, and the ugly. If you see a Western, you've seen the one where Clint Eastwood is uh, the marksman and someone's being lynched. They're being hung. And he shoots the rope as the, and the guy rides off. So that's my question to you is, and I do this because Janet Seifert thinks I'm the world's greatest artist. <laughs> and she proceeds to tell everybody. So this is the rope. And that's the noose. And that's someone who's in the noose. Sorry. There. Now, this person is, has been hung. And my question is, who's responsible? And my answer is, everyone in the lynch mob. No one gets out of it by saying, hey, all I did was slap the horse. Or, hey, all I did was tie the knot. Or, hey, I found the tree. Or, oh, I was a lookout, that's it. I was just the lookout. Everyone in the lynch mob is responsible. We know that. Now, here's the key to Jesus. God makes humans, and God is a 100% pure, good God. Pure good, 100%. 100%. Think about it if, like in school, we've got some students here. The exam grade for God's morality is a 100%. And he exists in a world, in, a, in an essence, not a world. He exists in an essence that requires 100% purity. 100%. You can't be 99.9% .9 good and be with God. you got to be 100% because God can't change. God can't take in Mr. 99%er who would be the best of the best of the best. 99%. Can't take him in because if he did, 
God would no longer be 100% pure good. So what's God got to do? God's got to take everybody from the 99 percenter who's really, really good to the one percenter who's a real stinkeroo. And God has to get them up to 100 percent. They need a righteousness that they don't have of their own if they're going to be with God because 99 percent doesn't make it. So there's a story that I was taught when I was young and in seminary school. It went like this. My Greek professor, the Pose at least, and, and a number of you knew Harvey Floyd or have met him. My Greek professor told me this one time in one of my Greek classes. He said, a man dies and he goes to heaven and he meets Peter at the pearly gates and he's in a little bit of a line and he overhears that it takes a hundred points to get in. The man feels very good because he had been a very good man. So he's feeling pretty confident before the Lord. So he gets there and Peter says, uh, he says, uh, uh, hello, it's good to have you here. And the man says, thank you very much. I understand it takes a hundred points to get in. Peter says, that's right. And the man says, well, let me tell you some of my good deeds. And he starts talking about all these incredible, I didn't lie, I didn't steal, I didn't cheat, I never killed anyone, I didn't, I, I uh, you know, was faithful to my wife, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Peter says, whoa, you're one of the best people we've had up here in a long time. I'm going to give you a point for that. <laughs> man said, a point? Yeah, that was impressive. Man said, oh, I forgot church. I left church out. Okay, let me tell you about church. I went to church. I was re attended regularly. I tithed my income. I honored the, the leadership at the church. Uh, uh, I, I worked in the youth program. I uh, uh, took communion. I, and he listed 350 things he did over his life that were great at church. Peter says, I got to tell you, I'm just telling you, it's maybe the best we've had in memory. Most impressive. I'm giving you another point. Man says, two points? He says, oh, the Bible. I left out the Bible. I've read the Bible through from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 79 times. I've memorized 173 Bible verses. I've con helped convert over a hundred people to Christianity. I've, and he listed out a thousand deeds related to the Bible and his work with others. Peter says, I must tell you, I don't remember anybody this good. I'm giving you another point. The guy says, that's three? I get three points for all of that? How but by the grace of God is anybody getting in there? Peter says, there's your hundred points. Come on in. <laughs> So who's more liable? Everyone. I'll tell you the most liable person between those two that in my mind is probably me because I think I'm probably worse than either of them because I've done things that I'm not proud of, things that embarrass and ashame me that I've done even knowing Jesus is the Messiah. They didn't know. I don't have that excuse. All right. Here are some questions about uh, Genesis and I'll creation. I'll try not to take seven minutes timeline. per question. Okay, so this person has a friend who is struggling with the timeline in Genesis and about dinosaurs and fossils. Oh, well, don't struggle at all. Instead, have fun. Let me tell you why you have fun. There is one way to read Genesis that is very, let's see if I can get this. There is one way to read Genesis that says there were seven 24-hour days and that 
inside that chronology, people lived a certain number of years, and you can do the math, and you can figure out that somewhere around 4,000, a little over 4,000 B.C., God made the world, and we've had a major flood that somehow in the midst of all of this destroyed the dinosaurs, etc. That's one way to read it. There's another way to read Genesis. Another way to read it is that Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void without form. In there, somehow, there's an entire existence that occurs before the rest of the creation story. And so we see fossils and remains and things that happened from all of that. And then at some point of destruction, there's the void and chaos and God begins to make things anew. And so you've got this is a new life. That's another way to read Genesis. There's a third way to read Genesis. <clears throat> a third way to read Genesis is that the story itself is one that's spoken to Israel by Moses at a time when Israel needed to understand the difference between true God and the Egyptian gods that they'd heard about and the Canaanite gods that they were being exposed to. And so the Egyptian gods are part of creation. The Canaanite gods are part of creation. And what Moses was instructing the Israelites is that God is over and responsible for creation. What's more is if we read it, we see that there are six days where God did his work. And those days align with the key verse, which is Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And so what we see here is the world is without form and it is void. And so what God does is for three days, he forms. And then for three days, he fills. It's without form and it's void. So the first thing he does is he forms light or day and night. And then on the second day, he forms the waters and the heavens. And then on the third day, he forms the earth and plants. Now he's formed these things, so now he needs to fill it. He fills day and night on day four. And he puts the sun, the moon, and the stars to fill it. He fills the heavens and the waters on day five with birds and fish. He fills the earth to eat the plants on day six with animals and people and creepy crawly things. Now, if you read Genesis in this way, you're trying to understand it within the culture in which it was written. And I've used as an explanation just the early, the creation story in Genesis 1, but it applies throughout all of the Genesis stories up into the time of Abraham where those stories are written in a way to try and communicate 
truths. Now, the fun part about this is God doesn't, look, you, you figure out which one makes the most sense to you. I, I, there, there's a world of possibilities. All three of these samples, and I could give you more samples of how to read Genesis, but all three of these samples are ones that hold to the integrity of Scripture. That's the key for me, is this is God's Word. We don't explain it away. We seek to understand it. And so all of these are consistent with integrity. But you, you, you go to England, you'll find many evangelical Bible-believing Christians who will embrace this along with a concept of evolution. With the idea that God made, the, if you want to know mechanically how he made it, they think that, that he made it mechanically through this process. Um, but this doesn't matter. I ascribe to this, even though I'm not an evolutionist. Because I don't think the story is telling us a 21st century science answer. So where are the dinosaurs? I'm not a young earth guy. I think the earth's been around for a long time. And dinosaurs were here. I don't think these were six 24-hour days where God in 24 hours made day and night and waits three days later after the plants to put the sun there. I think that this is talking about something in a much different light. So that's my two cents. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Quick announcement on your tables. You do have this pink form. Write down right now how many people are at your table so that we can take roll later on. We don't guess at Champion Force. We actually count. So if you would just jot that down, leave it on your table. Just leave it there. Don't take it anywhere. All right, here's some faster questions. Let's see if we can go okay, a little bit faster. Okay, Sorry. If Adam and Eve were the first people on earth, are we all brothers and sisters, or did God make some people in other ways in other areas? Well, now, that's an interesting one. But yes, we're all brothers and sisters uh, regardless. Um, I, I will say that I believe that God, you see, it goes back to the same <laughs> idea. I believe that, that the way God, I think God made this incredible world, but I do think that he made Adam and Eve uniquely special and that there were other human types around the world. And that Adam and Eve were special because they were made in God's image and they were endued with his spirit and, and a fellowship and a relationship with him and a purity and a, and a DNA wiring in their brains that, that cries out for a relationship with God. And I think ultimately we all descend from that and, and I do think they interbred. I think this is why they talk about Cain going out and there are already cities and he finds a wife. Uh, I think he's interbreeding outside the scope of God's design and plan. But hey, we're all the same. Jesus died for all of us. He says there's no Jew, no Gentile. There's no difference. All nations, all people, we are all common. So we're still staying in the Old Testament still. Uh, who was the witness or the, the one who received the revelation of the conversation between God and Satan at the beginning of Job? Uh, uh, oh, at the beginning of Job, we don't know. We don't know. Bible doesn't tell us. Okay, please comment on Mrs. Job and how she might have been impacted and the felt about... The first Mrs. Job or the second Mrs. Job? <laughs> You're going to have to get a job on that. Okay. <laughs> um, how she felt about what happened to Job, and because uh, we only hear about her bad moments. Yeah, well, I don't like to speak ill of the dead. <laughs> You know, she was in a tough situation. Uh, I wish Tim's not here. Are you here this morning, Tim? Tim's not here. I, I don't know. You know, there's, there's part of people who look at her and say she only loved him when things were going well. You know, it's like the saying, if I had a quarter for every woman that did not find me attractive, pretty soon they'd find me attractive. You know, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's right up there with my therapist tells me my narcissism 
<laughs> is causing me to misread social situations. I'm pretty sure she was hitting on me. Uh, <laughs> those two to go together. We don't know enough to know. I will say this. Um, life can be a struggle, even for godly people. And it puts a strain on marriage, and it puts a strain on sanity, and it puts a strain on focus, but it also can be a magnet that draws you together if you turn to the Lord in the midst of it. And so I read the story of Job and my heart goes out to anybody who suffers at all, but my prayer is always the same. May the suffering bring them to the one who gives comfort and who works good out of bad. So, moving down to the New Testament, a little soteriology or salvation. Once saved, always saved? I hope so. Um, you know, there are two passages that trouble me on the once saved, always saved. There are some passages in Hebrews that, that, that are troubling and hard to understand. So this is where I land on that. And please understand that I'm, I've landed here today, but I've floated all around this in my life and may land somewhere different next week. Um, but I feel pretty good about this. Um, I, I think when you are saved, God puts his Holy Spirit within you and he draws you to him. And I think he will sooner take your life than he'll let you fall away. Um, now, does that mean that it's absolutely impossible for someone to, in essence, be a Satan? And Satan was in the province of God and in the heavenlies and decided he wanted uh, to rebel against God, and he chose to. Um, can humans do that same thing and make that choice? I think perhaps, but I think that it's not just the normal oh, gee, he quit going to church or she quit, you know, this, that, and the other. I think, I think God's in this for the long haul, and his goal is to keep the sheep that were entrusted to him. So I answer the question, yes, but I put an asterisk by it saying, I'm not going to take a bullet over it because there may be something that I'm not seeing. So if someone does not believe in God, but is a good person during his whole life, should uh, that person go to hell? Well, if by a good person, you mean that they are 99%, <laughs> they're not going to live eternally with a 100% pure God who can't change. God can't decide to be a 99% pure God and embrace us if we're 99 percenters. So then the question becomes, well, will God just do round up? <laughs> Well, the reason God rounds up for everybody, including the one percenter, is one reason alone. It's because the, the price has been paid for the sin. And that is a hundred points. That's a hundred percent love and a hundred percent righteousness and a hundred percent justice. And God, Jesus, is in God. So all I got to do is be in Jesus and I get the hundred percent. And I get in Jesus through my faith. So I got faith. I'm in Jesus. I'm 100%. I'm 99%. And I'm standing there on my own, not trusting Jesus, saying, God, come on. I was pretty good. God says, yeah, you were. I'm so sorry. That's not good enough. <laughs> okay, so if God is the one who gives people faith, does withholding faith mean that God desires that some remain in darkness? Well, God gives faith and we believe. It's a two-step process. We're not machines. God doesn't just, you know, run a program in our brains. Uh, upload faith. <sighs> Takes three minutes because the internet's slow and you have that wheel of death going around, <laughs> or wheel of despair until it's loaded. That's, that's not the way it works. I mean, look, I can give you this, but you've got to take it. You give it to me, but I've got to take it. I mean, it's, it's a two-part 
deal there. So yes, God gives us faith, and yes, we choose to believe. Those two, have to, those two are, are two so, sides of a coin. Final salvation question, at what moment is a person born again? Well, it depends on how you view time. You know, uh, uh, the day I was saved happened right there on Calvary. But my actual rebirth was when I said to God, Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100%. I need you. I repent. I confess. I'm sorry I'm not 100%. I wish I was 100%. But Lord, would you please let Jesus be my 100%. I'm going to trust him for that. I'm going to trust you for that. And when you put your faith into God, when you say, God, it's yours. I'm trusting you to be my 100%. I can't be good enough alone. You're born again. You're born anew. You're born from above. And he puts his spirit within you. And you are a new creation. Okay, so here we, you've been asked questions. And from your brain, you just rattle off these great answers. How do you find time, uh, so other than what you already know, how do you find time to do your court cases and prepare for a lesson each week? Um, well, I, some days are better than others. <laughs> some days you get more sleep than others. I'm a lawyer to pay the bills so I can do this without charging. This, this is all I've ever wanted to do with my life other than take care of my family is, is, is teach other people about the Lord. And so this is my calling, if you will. It turns out that the law stuff does, I'm, I'm, I'm okay at it. It, it, it. it does good and gets me notoriety, but I'm convinced God blesses what I do legally only to expand the ministry of what I've got to say. And so, well, that's scary. It, it makes it scary. But, but I try real hard to humbly seek his wisdom in how to do it. And by his graciousness, he manages to find time. And I want to tell you also that it's because I have an incredible family who loves me, who encourages me and upbuilds me with this. My wife takes care of so much stuff that y'all would think I was a spoiled little puppy, and I am. And then I've got so many friends in here. I mean, Mark, and so many of you, Mel, who, who pray for me on a regular basis, and I live on your prayers. So I, I give credit to y'all and my family and the Lord. All right. Um, is gambling a sin? You want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I, I would tell people don't gamble to, to, to get rich. Don't gamble to make money. If you find it entertaining and you're using it as entertainment, I've been to a casino to actually pay money two or three times. And, and the first time, Becky and I were in Constantinople, and there was a casino in the basement of the hotel. And we were going to go out to dinner. And I said, hey, Beck, instead of going out to dinner, why don't we go eat at the casino? We'll take the $50 we were going to use for dinner, and you'll take $25, and I'll take $25. We'll have a contest and see who can last the longest. And we'll just <laughs> agree now we're going to spend the 50 bucks. This is entertainment. This isn't gambling. She said, okay. So she goes to the blackjack table, and she starts playing. I'm scouting the slot machines because I'm figuring out I'm going to find the ladies who have just exhausted their quarters and not gotten the big ka -ching. And then they're going to get up and leave. That machine's going to be nine months pregnant, ready to give birth. <laughs> so sure enough, this lady, she's gone through her thing. She gets up and leaves. It takes three minutes to take all 25 of my dollars, and I'm busted. I go back to the blackjack table. Beck, you won. And she says, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I said, what do you mean? She says, I got 50 bucks. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, give me 25. This machine over there is pregnant. It is ready to give birth to coinage. So she gives me 25 bucks. I go back to the machine and I put it in. It takes three minutes. It eats all my money. I go back to bank. How are you doing now? She says, well, I'm back up. I've got 40 bucks. I said, okay, this is ridiculous. Give me half of yours. I'm just going to sit here. Tell me what to do. 
<laughs> we lasted for about another hour before we were broke. So I, I, I look at gambling as something that is giving away your money to someone else. That's what it is. If you want to give away your money, you better be a darn good steward because there are people starving who could use that money much better than you giving it away. But within the framework of that, if you're a good steward and you are out there and you are entertaining, I'm still not a big fan of it because I think it goes to organized crime and other stuff like that, but I'm not going to throw rocks at you because I did it. All right, so we're out of time, but you've already had lunch, and so you may be able to say just for one more minute, this is how we ended our last question and answer. Tom, uh, this came across. They want to know, is it true that alcohol has never crossed your lips? Is it? If uh, either way, what's your advice for those of anyone who has not begun drinking? Okay, let me be real clear here. I don't think that it's a sin to socially drink. I think it's a sin to drink in excess. I'm going to be 58 this year, and I've never had a, a social drink. Can I say alcohol's never passed my lips? I've taken NyQuil, <laughs> and I think it's got some alcohol in it. And I've had things that have the alcohol cooked out. Vanilla has alcohol in it. That's not going to stop me from eating a piece of cake or a <laughs> peanut butter cookie that certain people make. But, although I don't think you put vanilla in yours. But anyway, I, I don't drink. I, I, I have a compulsive personality. It's not something that um, I would feel safe. I, I, come on, I've made it 57 years without alcohol. Why start now? I don't, I don't even know what the stuff tastes like. Who gives a rip? But I don't, I mean, there's, there's not a problem with social drinking. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not one of those who... who judges other people for it. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't think drunkenness is good. And I'll also, I told this, I gave a commencement address to a, a law school uh, graduate. I've given a bunch of them, but to one in particular where I just said, hey, uh, you want to know where I've made a lot of money? I have made a lot of money by not drinking because the lawyers who drink start talking and I have learned so many things they'd have never told me when they were sober. <laughs> I just show up, and take notes. Oh, tell me more about that. <laughs> and then we got a witness. I said, yeah, and what's that witness's name? <laughs> uh, so, so, so all to say... <laughs> All to say, you know, we, we, need to be, we need to be good and responsible in our lives before the Lord. Praise the Lord. We've had a great, great morning. Again, if you don't have your, please. We're going to close like we always do. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing over you, fill out your uh, forms. And uh, if you have any other questions that we didn't answer yours, uh, turn them in. We'll still look at some questions. We can email them. And we can email Put them in. We, we can email them, too. That, that's zero qualms. That's, that's always a fun thing to do. So email them. Put them on the website. Uh, uh, things like that. I don't mean to shortchange, and I talked too much to this morning, and I'm sorry. Right. Let's pray. Would you stand on your feet? Our Heavenly Father, as we leave today, we, we certainly do not presume upon you, and we thank you that you have blessed the food to our bodies, that we would have life and to live it to your glory. Thank you for Mark and for his teaching, for his counsel, that you would help us to learn and to grow. Uh, let him spur us on, but that we would be students of your word as uh, he has been teaching us how to study, to show ourselves approved as we move down into your scriptures and you speak to us on a daily basis, Father. And I also pray that you help us to tell others about who you are and what you've done in our lives so that they can know the Jesus that died on the cross for their sin to bring them up to the 100% mark. For this week, we pray your blessings. We look forward to serve Saturday on Saturday, that you would give us a great weather to serve our community, and that we do it in your name. There's no question. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.